the the basic idea of the electric universe is that you should be able to teach this in primary school. So it's not difficult. The difficulty is in letting go of what you think you know. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Well, I'm just going to start this by saying welcome, Wal Thornhill from the Electric Universe. You are the the lead, the sort of the tip of the spear, right, when That's it right. comes to the, <laughs> the uh, Electric Universe model and its evolution and uh, getting that out into the world. So before we talk all about that, if you could introduce the listeners to yourself, please, just, just take a minute. Okay. I was... Uh born in Melbourne, Australia, uh, during the Second World War. And uh, I found that I was uh, curious about the moon and uh, other things. And I had an uncle who was uh, a commando in New Guinea, and he brought home a field telescope. And we put it on a veranda outside the, our place uh, in Melbourne, and um, he'd show me the moon. And, uh, of course, this inspired me. So that meant that I read everything I could about astronomy and space and I memorized stuff and used to bore the kids at school by reciting this at uh, show and tell. <laughs> uh, so it seems I was uh, destined to do what I've been, what I'm doing now uh, all my life. Although I didn't pursue astronomy um, as a discipline for all of my working life, I went through university, I began postgraduate studies uh, at Melbourne University in upper atmosphere research. But partway through that year, because I'd been asking questions related to the work of Emmanuel Velikovsky and his idea that the solar system had changed within man's memory, uh, I found hostility or, or people just wouldn't listen, you know, wouldn't uh, take the time to try and answer the question. So I realized that if I was going to pursue that, and that had become my passion by this stage, because I felt that Velikovsky had made a very strong case to answer. You couldn't just dismiss his identification of Venus as the archetypal doomsday comet uh, and so on, because while I was doing majoring in science and physics and so on at university, I was the only science student that I know of who haunted the shelves of the anthropology section of the library. And I would put, pick books at random off the shelf dealing with the early creation stories and the myths and legends of uh, countries around the world. And the stories leapt off the page at me when, when viewed uh, from Velikovsky's forensic style of uh, research. And, of course, Velikovsky's book was the bestseller in New York for six months running in 1950. And then the astronomers decided they'd had enough because it was against their religion. And uh, they had the book burned by the academic publisher, Macmillan. Now, so there is a modern day book burning. <laughs> and uh, it also shows that our beliefs about uh, the universe and cosmology and so on are just a, another form of religion. A number of leading astronomers have actually said and written that astronomy, including um, Sir Fred Hoyle, that uh, astronomy, cosmology has a great deal in common with religion. And you can understand that because there's been a tradition going back uh, into the dim distant past of astronomer priests who were the ones who had uh, great influence. And you can understand that when you realize that the ancient peoples were still worried about the sky falling in, you know, that things would happen again, that the gods would return and uh, create uh, havoc on the earth and um, we'd be threatened with doomsday, the destruction of us, our world, everything. And this explains that strange fear we have of comets. Uh, why would we, we associate the modern apparitions in the sky, which are quite benign and quite beautiful at times, with the destruction of the world, of the end of the world. Well, Velikovsky answered all these questions and a whole lot more, and he made a lot of predictions which were outrageous at the time, one of them being that Venus would be extremely hot, not just, you know, uh, 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or something like that at the surface, because at the time it was thought that it would be kind of tropical maybe or even less because the thick cloud cover would prevent the kind of uh, weather we get here on, on Earth. 
So when the first spacecraft, the Mariner missions, went past Venus, they couldn't believe it because it said it's uh, 600 degrees. And then because they didn't believe it, they sent another spacecraft and they said it's 800 degrees. Well, Velikovsky in uh, the 1950s had predicted that Velikovsky, that um, Venus was witnessed as an incandescent object in the sky. And so he said that um, this being the case, it hasn't had much time to cool down. He also made a whole lot of other predictions like radio noise from Jupiter when that was totally unexpected. Uh, and all of these things subsequently were shown to be correct, including some of the findings on the moon, which puts uh, paid to the idea that uh, the whole moon uh, shot thing was uh, all put up and uh, was a fake. <laughs> because if it hadn't, if it was a fake, they would have found the things they expected. <laughs> Anyway, so that wow. gives you a bit of the background. Uh, I got involved uh, in the early 70s. I, I was in the university in the early 60s. In the early 70s, there was an, a, a um, science uh, publication at uh, the university in Portland, Oregon, uh, called Ponce, and the controversy was revisited over 10 issues. And I subscribed to that. I, I began corresponding with the people involved, uh, David Talbot and Stephen Talbot, his brother. And I was invited to the first International Velikovsky Conference in 1974 in Ontario. It was um, in Hamilton. And there I met Velikovsky. And I also met some of the other people who were the sort of leading lights. Now, I was considered at that stage a helpful researcher. So I was involved uh, more strongly with the people organising it than the general audience were. I actually sat next to David Talbot at the banquet at the final evening and neither of us realised that 20 years later I would end up being invited to David Talbot's conference in Portland, Oregon, uh, where he was presenting for the first time a movie that he'd made called Remembering the End of the World. And this was, now Dave, what David did was to take what Velikovsky had hinted at in the later pages of his work, Worlds in Collision, that the gas giants, uh, Jupiter and Saturn, were involved very heavily in some of these events in mankind's memory. And in fact, that uh, Saturn was regarded as the primeval sun and the words Sol and Helios and so on were originally associated with uh, the planet Saturn. Now, none of this makes any sense whatsoever in terms of our understanding of gravity, Newton's laws and modern science. So my task, I felt, was to try and understand what it is we really didn't understand about the basics like gravity. So in uh, 1979, this is five years after the conference in um, uh, Ontario, I was working for the government in Washington, D.C., and I rang Velikovsky, mentioned the fact that we'd met, and asked if it would be possible to visit him at his home, and he graciously did that, invited us, my family was with me, so we I've got photos of Velikovsky with my daughters, but none with me. I was too shy to <laughs> ask for a photo. Anyway, uh, my question for Velikovsky was, what is it we don't understand about gravity? Because this is critical. If we're going to understand the universe, the two things we must understand is the real nature of light and the real nature of gravity. And at present, we understand neither. Hmm. We don't understand the basics. And this gets down to all it, the knock-on effects go right through all of science and the sorts of things that uh, your listeners are interested in, in uh, natural therapies and uh, all of the taboo science, uh, sciences at present, because it ties it all together. And uh, Velikovsky at that meeting gave me a slim volume which he'd written back in the 1940s where he gave his idea about the nature of gravity. And the basic idea I uh, have decided was correct, and that is that all matter in the universe is made from positive and negative charged particles, the proton and the electron being the, the key ones. 
and also a particle which uh, scientists have great difficulty in detecting and even uh, figuring out what the heck it is, and that's the neutrino. So the electric universe model deals with those three uh, uh, things, the, the proton, positive charge, the electron, negative charge, and neutrino, neutral charge, and they are the building blocks of everything we see. People might say, what about the neutron in, in uh, atoms? Well, the neutron doesn't exist except outside the atom as a brief dance between a proton and an electron in its nuclear state before it falls apart. You cannot hold a positively charged nucleus together with just positive charge and neutral particles. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever because the, uh, the repulsive forces would be phenomenal. But if you have electrons and protons in a kind of almost crystalline structure in the nucleus, the electrons sit on average halfway between the protons, then the forces between the protons is only a quarter of the attractive force between the proton and the nearest electron, if you can understand that. Mm -hmm. So that the whole thing is cohesive. It is powerfully cohesive, as we know, because when you take the thing apart, that energy is released, and we see that in atomic explosions and, and nuclear energy. So this is a simple picture of the fundamental. And Velikovsky gave me that uh, clue. And this might be a bit long-winded, but it, it's a he heck of a story. And it <laughs> yeah, keep going. <laughs> At my age, um, I can connect the dots much better than I ever could <laughs> partway through this journey. Uh, it was only uh, two years later, I think it was December 1981, there was a tiny little advertisement in the Scientific American, the Journal of Classical Physics. Now, what Velikovsky had done was take the classical physics approach. That is, you look at the observations, you uh, look at the experiments and so on, and try and determine what is the simplest model that would explain this. Because the whole thing about science is it's pattern matching. You see something, you try and figure out what does that look like, and then try and, and understand it in terms of something else that you know about. This tiny little advertisement in the Scientific American, December 1981, was by a fellow called Ralph Sansbury, who was a mathematician basically and a musician and uh, a host of other things uh, who was interested in this question and he had shown that just by repeating the pattern of the, at the atom where you have electrons orbiting a positively charged nucleus if you then go down one more level and say well what if the electron and the proton these parts that make up the atom also have a structure and on doing that, he was able to show how you could derive the magnetic force, gravitational force, and so on, purely on the basis of repeating a pattern. Now, this is another thing that nature does, and this is why people talk about you know, the fractal universe, because you repeat patterns at different scales. There's a little more to it than that, because it depends on the scale what force is dominant, mm -hmm. and that changes the pattern structures. But anyway... The repeated pattern is another means of simplification, and this is what classical science was all about, classical physics. You were trying to always simplify, trying to find the explanation in terms of simpler and simpler concepts. You weren't there trying to invent new forces and new particles and get a Nobel Prize. In fact, the Nobel Prize, I think, has been a disaster from that point of view because it encourages people to invent things that aren't there. <laughs> and make up stories about things that aren't there. So there are, the history of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century uh, will be a – people will scratch their heads in, in disbelief in the future looking back at, over this period uh, because at this stage, one of the, the most difficult things through all of this journey, which has been most of my life, has been giving up things that I've been taught. It's such a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Uh, it's much harder than learning something. Uh, if you come to something as a beginner, you're, you're willing to accept ideas and um, think, of, think about them maybe and then put them away. Now I know that. This is what our education system is all about. Mm -hmm. Just learn all these facts and you'll be an expert, my son. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me pause you there, Walt, because uh, I, there's still, I'm just kind of feeling some listeners may be thinking, okay, can you just tell me 
in a minute or less what the electric universe model is. Okay. The electric universe model uh, is based on, as I said, the fact that all matter is made up of positive and negatively charged particles. And neutral particles are a combination of the two. In other words, they are another step up in complexity. The two major features of the electric universe that are different from what we're being taught is that the electric force acts, as far as we can tell, on our even on our galactic scale, instantaneously. There is no speed of light delay. I mean, the speed of the electric force has nothing to do with the speed of light. The other thing is that light is a disturbance in a medium. You cannot, there is no such thing as empty space. So Maxwell and all of his electromagnetic uh, work required an ether, a medium through which this uh, disturbance could travel. Just like, you know, the waves on a pond when you drop a stone in. You cannot have a wave in nothing. <laughs> So this is a one of the these are all major problems with uh, current science. The other thing is that Einstein uh, did away with our standards of measurement by making everything relative. You can't do that. You just cannot do it because once you do, you stop doing physics, because physics relies on standards of measurement of both space and time, and space and time have nothing to do with each other. Uh, the universe uh, has a universal clock, and the rate at which your clock ticks depend upon depends upon the energy state of you or your clock or whatever. Uh, of course, <laughs> I'm so glad we're talking, Wall. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Okay, from the outside, and I'm very new to understanding this model. It, it seems mm -hmm. controversial. People are like, it's categorically wrong, or they love it. There's this highly polarized, <laughs> it's very much like the model itself. And I will say that what I find very interesting as well is how many natural uh, medicine practitioners and biophysicists are aligning with the model. And that's actually how I learned about it. I see. <clears throat> well, uh, Rupert Sheldrake is a good friend. And he has done, I, I originally came upon his work back in the 80s when I was working in London. Uh, and his idea of morphic fields. Now, a field is a description, it's not an explanation. So I looked at that and I thought the electric universe can explain that in terms of resonances between uh, dis distant matter, you know. And this is what the quantum theorists have found, this so-called entanglement and spooky action at a distance. That is the signaling system that biological systems use. You cannot be shielded. It's exactly like gravity. Gravity is the subtle connection between stars and galaxies and uh, planets and their, their uh, central star. Uh, gravity is exactly the same. It's the direct electric force between the constituents of the atoms, the electron and the proton. Now, that means that, the, if, for instance, in a biological system, if you have some complex arrangement of atoms in a biological molecule, that whole molecule is singing like it's like a symphony being played at once. And any other molecule in the body which has the same conformation, the same structure, is in tune with it. They're all connected instantaneously, no speed of light delay, anything. And you begin to realize that you could not actually have a living system without that kind of interconnection and control. The trillions of things that are going on in your body, or countless things that are going on in your body at any instant, is not controllable by anything that has the slow, you know, one foot per nanosecond speed of light delay. I often say, uh, imagine a tennis player, one of the uh, top tennis players, trying to return a serve that's coming at him at over 100 kilometres an hour. His whole mind and body has to be connected with that ball in real time. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd never be able to return the surf. Mm -hmm. Coherence seems to be the, the word to describe order mm -hmm. in the system, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about. And disease, if you want to use that word, is, is really an, is just incoherence or a disorder that's occurring in the system. 
yeah, it's a, a kind of a different uh, a different tune being played in the body, which uh, the bo- is alien to the uh, workings of the uh, uh, you know the system that it's in. Um, the funny thing is, of course, that this coherence applies at all scales. And the fellow that I mentioned earlier, Ralph Sansbury, in his Journal of Classical Physics, pointed out that his model for the electron to remain stable, knowing its classical size, which is extremely tiny, the particles within it would have to be orbiting at such a speed that if they were released from that uh, electron, they could fly from here to the other side of the Andromeda galaxy in one second. So that gives you an idea that the electric force must operate faster than that. Mm. And there's another astronomer who uh, calculated based on uh, close binary stars that the uh, speed of gravity must operate 20 billion times the speed of light. Greater than, you know, that was the that was the minimum it had to operate at. So this is how we this is what we're talking about now. And the electric universe is all about connectedness universal connectedness and our connectedness with the planet because we communicate with the planet just like the planet communicates with us we are earthlings which raises issues about if we want to try and colonize mars for instance (laughs) will we become martians these are the questions that are not being asked because the basic science is not there and all the puzzlement and all the all the confusion that you see in the science journals when they make a new discovery is due to the fact that the basic science has failed us. You mentioned uh, Maxwell's laws and that um, this concept of ether, this kind of substrate through which mm-hmm. these waves are passing through, to yes. to even exist in the first place. This it, it could you is this also what plasma is? No. Okay. They're two, two different things. Yes, tell us. Um, <laughs> there was a, a chap, a radiation uh, physicist, uh, back in the 1970s, uh, who I came across through the Ponce articles, the ones that the um, issues that were looking at, at subjects around Velikovsky's work, uh, and he wrote a. Uh, some articles about the idea that the ether is a sea of neutrinos. In other words, that the universe is full of these ephemeral particles which can travel through the earth as if it's not there. Uh, And uh, the the reason that I picked up on that is the fact that if you are going to send an electromagnetic disturbance through this medium, the medium has to be constructed from polarizable particles. Otherwise, it, it just wouldn't work. And then I realized that uh, what this fellow, Dr. Horace Dudley, had done was uh, show um, the most sensible answer to the problem. And that is that if you've got this sea of particles which must have mass, you cannot have a particle without mass, despite what scientists tell us, uh, the mass must be vanishingly small and the particle must be neutral to be able to pass through other objects. But at the same time, having mass, it will form a kind of an atmosphere around a body like the Earth or the Sun. And um, and this is important for other issues concerning Einstein's work uh, and the bending of light. Uh, but once you have said that, you have a means for understanding how the electric force operates through so-called empty space, because all of these little things will line up like a whole lot of little magnets with their north-south, north-south, north-south poles daisy-chained together. And it's that direct connection, like a, <clears throat> if you can imagine, this, this little string of magnets is actually like a, a taut rod. And this is why the planets can stay where they are in, and remain coherent is because they know exactly where the sun is at this instant. If they didn't, we'd all be, we'd all be slung out of the solar system like you know, whirling a rock around your head and then letting go. Um, in the uh, biological systems, this direct connection also transfers information at the sort of frequencies that operate inside the atom and inside molecules. And this is the signaling system within biological uh, systems and living systems but it also means that uh, who we are and what we are is more than what we see because these signals 
also carry information, and that information can be held in the ether. Uh, all of these ideas, of course, uh, I worked in the computing industry all my working life uh, because there was more money than uh, being a heretic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so I you know, have the concepts of uh, you know, information storage and um, all that kind of stuff uh, under my belt. And I can see why all of this activity trying to produce uh, quantum computers and that is a little misguided in that they don't really understand. There's no theory to explain quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a recipe book without any explanation of the things that you're using to uh, cook the dish. <clears throat> so that is another aspect of the electric universe that gets an explanation. Tell us then about plasma, because this is pretty foundational to electric universe. It is, yes. Okay. When you have, uh, well, our experience on the Earth's surface is of particles, atoms and so on, which are in electrical balance. So we don't get electric shocks when we touch things. Um, Everything is practically neutral most of the time. When it's not, you get things like a lightning discharge, which is a plasma phenomenon. And in that case, the electric field has been strong enough to actually strip electrons from an atom, so it leaves a positively charged atom and these free electrons. That is a plasma. Now, you can get a plasma even in a flame, uh, and you can affect the flame of a candle with a magnet because the particles have been separated into their positive and negative. You know, just a few, just a few atoms will lose an electron, and that then becomes a plasma, and it will respond to a magnetic field and an electric field. Once you have a plasma, even if one particle in 10,000 is ionized and the rest are neutral, it will behave like a plasma, which is quite different to a fluid or a wind and so on. So when astronomers talk about the solar wind, it's completely misleading because we're talking about a plasma. That is an electric current. A wind in a plasma is an electric current. But yeah, that, that is, um, that, that's a really interesting point that you're making. I was just talking to a biophysicist last week, in fact, t- discussing how this solar wind, right, is uh, responsible for the lightning strikes as it passes mm. through the ionosphere, mm. which then transfers these free electrons to the Earth that we can gather through our feet, through the process of mm. grounding, uh, mm. and, and, and its disruption of the geomagnetic field. Right? And yes, <clears throat> they're all tied together. That's the other thing. There is only the electric force in the electric universe. There is none other. All of the others are manifestations of the electric force. It's the response of matter to the electric force. And if the matter is made up of positive and negative charges, they can distort in an electric field or a magnetic field. And when they distort, they become like little magnets. So the magnet- magnetism is the distortion of matter in an electric field. And the same goes for gravity. Gravity and magnetism are very similar. They're only, uh, the difference is only in the way they manifest. Um, but I won't talk about that here because we're not dealing with um, uh, how gravity works and how, uh, <laughs> how it can be repulsive as well as attractive. Mm. Our problem is, of course, we have this geocentric approach to science. The things we witness and test and experiment with on Earth, we then extrapolate out to the rest of the universe in an attempt to understand it. That's an understandable approach, but it's very limited because we assume that our conditions here on this Earth are applicable throughout the universe. And yet we're in a fairly restricted and very um, unusual environment in the universe because most of the universe is composed of separated charges, plasma, you know, and so on. And here we are sitting in this little cocoon on the Earth where all of that, those electric charges are all happy uh, chappies. <laughs> They're all in equal numbers, and we don't suffer from electrical um, uh, problems very much anyway. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit more about that. You made this comment about us being earthlings and we're uniquely evolved to this atmosphere, this elect- electromagnetic atmosphere. Uh, tell us more yeah. about this connection, how we are interacting with the Earth. <clears throat> well, um, this uh, so-called spooky action at a distance uh, that the quantum physicists have discovered and have difficulty in understanding. If you, under- if you 
can understand the electric universe model where it's easily explained by this direct electric force, so there is a connection, then we and everything we observe is connected to us instantly. So this process of even seeing is is more than meets the eye. <laughs> In other words, there is, a, there is a direct connection between what you're observing and, and the you. It's not just uh, light waves. The light waves come after the event. You actually sense something before you see it. Uh, and this is something that Rupert Sheldrake has uh, talked about in his books. Um, now, where can we go with that? The, this means that the structure of the Earth and the electrification of the Earth and its response to its electrical environment creates signals. There's the Schumann resonance, for instance, that uh, people generally seem to know about. This is the kind of a resonant effect in the, between the ionosphere and the Earth of electrical activity in the atmosphere. Then there's the behavior of the sun. Now, it's been found that uh, even the manifestation of certain um, diseases, changes in radioactivity, all of these kinds of things are related to what's going on in the sun. In fact, they've even found that activity on the far side of the sun has an effect on the radioactive decay rate of uh, uh, radioactive elements. So what goes on in the sun affects us. But since we're so intimately connected with the Earth uh, through both the gravitational attraction and this um, signaling of all the subatomic particles within us and the Earth together and all of the other living things that are on the Earth, um, you begin to understand how you the intelligence of the universe can set up uh, symbiotic arrangements between living creatures. You know, for instance, we are composed of a huge number of bacteria, um, all of which are essential for our well-being and our existence. So there's this symbiotic uh, relationship, which is not explained as a result of just random uh, mutations and that kind of thing. <laughs> there's no such thing as this kind of randomness uh, in the universe. The universe is a connected, um, conscious, if you like to put it that way, uh, entity. Well, it, uh, it, it, your comment makes me think of the mitochondrion, uh, simply because we're talking about this, this bacteria that we sort of incorporated into our system, which is electrical mm -hmm. in nature. It's sort of mm. the, uh, the biological manifestation of this whole force going on working for us. Do you have yes. any, any perspectives that you can offer us on the mitochondria? Well, it has its own DNA, um, which um, I think shows that it was a separate organism at some point. But when we talk about coherence, this coherence extends between uh, living systems, uh, not just within a living system. Uh, it also means that uh, epigenetics is uh, the, the recent discovery of this connectedness, the fact that we, our, our genetic information is more or less a, um, uh, a workshop floor. It's got all of the uh, information there required to produce the proteins and whatever that are needed for life. But the instructions, uh, and I agree with Bruce Lipton on this, the instructions come from the intelligence received at the cell wall. So the cell wall has um, receptors which are um, able to detect information from hormones and things in the bloodstream and uh, other you know, nutrients and whatnot. But there are also receptors on the cell wall, it seems, for signals from beyond the body. And this is also essential for consciousness and memory and things like that, to assume that uh, who we are resides in that um, grey porridge in your head is, um, is rather you know, stretching it. <laughs> uh, if we're part of a conscious universe, then uh, we're a representation of it. We're not the consciousness, we're part of it, it seems to me. And I think this fits with a lot of what a lot of philosophers have uh, uh, now believe or have said in the past a lot of people I realize as I go through life have already come across the things that I've discovered for myself it's been done before nothing new under the sun it uh, seems that many many of sort of the older the older 
uh, civilizations that have been around for a while, pre, sort of pre-Roman, if you will, have had these mm -hmm. sort of integrated understandings of themselves within within the universe or within the yes. earth, right? Um, it's only been relatively recently that there's <clears throat> been a separation model. Yes. Uh I think our cosmology has been an attempt to create another creation myth, but one which uh, we're, we're in control. The problem for the ancients was that uh, the universe seemed to be totally outside their control. So they tried to appease the gods with, uh, in the extreme, you know, human sacrifices. Um, but the science has tried to create their own myth where we appear to be in control. And this is part of the thing behind um, uh, the global warming. Uh, if we blame it on us, then it, it gives the uh, appearance that we can control it, which is nonsense. Uh, you know, we're a part of the sun's electrical circuit. So whatever happens to the sun, which is different, and it is different right now, will also affect the earth because we're like a tiny part of a, a circuit uh, of the sun forget who which scientist i was reading was talking about these climate events changing literally every planet in our solar system is that's experiencing right, yes. this this is not an earth phenomenon no and that's you're, that's you're right. saying it's because of the sun yes yes we're all part well, i mean we're in the sun circuit that uh, solar wind which sort of comes out roughly or in the plane of the solar system is one part of the circuit there's also a circuit which comes in at the poles of the sun. That's the other part of the connection to the galaxy. Um, so anything that happens to the sun is uh, partly modulated by the power source of the sun. So when there are changes on the sun, we can be sure that uh, we are being affected as well. There's been a change in the power supply. And this will change our climate. But the... There's so much more to this story. Uh, the reason I teamed up with Dave Talbot was that he was doing the research on what was it the ancients were so desperate to tell us about. What did they mean when they spoke about uh, the thunderbolts of the gods? And um, how can we find out with any degree of uh, confidence what that story is? And Velikovsky showed us the way to do that. You use the forensic technique where you use modern science and our understanding of the Earth's motion in the solar system and everything. And you look at what the ancients said on one part of the world, uh, say like you know Joshua and the day the sun stood still, and you say, well, what could cause that effect? And it would be a disturbance of the Earth's rotation. What would be the result on the other side of the world, say in the, um, the Americas? And uh, he, he said, well, it would be nighttime over there. Uh, do we find any records of any unusual happenings? We, because these things were so unusual that uh, the ancients recorded them. You, know, you had to have to remember this story because this is important. And uh, in South America, the South American Indians uh, reported a time when there was an extended night. The stars fell from the sky. In other words, there were meteor showers and all the forest burned. Now, putting those three things together, it sounds like some cataclysmic event. And then if, if you consider the other side of the world, and there, were, there was the earthquake, of course, and all of this sort of thing, um, you realise that there, this is something which you should stick on the board as being um, reasonable evidence. But then you go ahead and you say, well, what other things were uh, spoken about that were unusual by these peoples? And you try and tie them together and see if there's anything that we're using modern science we can uh, have some degree of uh, confidence in this being a fact and not just um, you know, an unreliable witness. Doing that, he was able to piece the story of the solar system back before we had our present sun. This sounds absolutely, you know, <laughs> I mean, when you first come across this idea, you think, no, this can't be so, and I don't want to know about it anyway because it's all too horrible to contemplate. <laughs> but the story is more phenomenal than any science fiction story ever written. Uh, and we can back it up because in the year 2000, we had a meeting in Portland, Oregon, and we had uh, one of the leading 
uh, cosmologists, astronomers in the audience. We had a leading plasma physicist in the audience, and we had all the leading comparative mythologists who were um, well aware of uh, this piecing together of ancient history, the stories of the sky. And uh, lo and behold, this guy from Los Alamos Labs said, we well, started drawing pictures on the board. He said, these are some plasma instabilities I've seen in the lab, and these experiments are the highest energy electrical discharges mankind's able to perform on Earth, where you've got more power than all the power stations on Earth concentrated into something the size of a baked bean tin. And uh, they stand back about a kilometre and use telescopes to watch what goes on in this lab, and then they, after the experiment, they go and... Uh, put it back together again for a couple hundred thousand dollars <laughs> for, the, for the next shot. So you get some idea of the power. Anyway, these instabilities take on some remarkable forms. Uh, the, some of them are quite beautiful. But one of the key ones is what's called the squatter man, where you have this uh, symbol where the two upraised arms with, at right angles and the legs are out at right angles as well. And then there's the body and and the head, and be, but between the uh, the upraised arms and the outstretched legs, there are two circles, and you'll find this around the world. And the question is, what the dickens are those circles? And he, when he, when he showed one of his pictures, here it was: is the upraised arms, the two bright circles, and the outstretched legs. And this is from the plasma lab. So he uh, changed his life. He then uh, in, instituted an ex a global search for these petroglyphs, as they're called, because these are all prehistoric. So here we were tying the prehistoric record to modern science, the electric universe science, and showing that um, all of this fits together and what the ancients were describing and a lot of the symbolism in uh, modern religions comes from those incredible forms in the sky. And you can begin to understand what we meant by the kingdom of heaven and, you know, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's all this about doing things on earth? Well, the, some of these events were catastrophic. As our plasma physicist uh, friend said, at certain points in this pattern, because it changes over time, and all of these forms are found on the rocks, by the way. So this was added proof. Um, he said there are some forms which are lethal because the radiation from it is um, X-rays. Anyone out in the open, when this is going on, would not last very long at all, not long enough to chisel anything in rock. So he then found, with that in mind, that you find these petroglyphs in certain spots, in canyons and that up high up on walls. And when he looked at that, he found that um, they only had a view of the sky uh, towards the horizon in a certain direction. In other words, they were shielding themselves from the brightest part of the um the display in the sky because <laughs> a few poor souls have probably gone out and tried to chisel these things in some other spot and uh, died in the attempt. <laughs> uh, right. <clears throat> so with, you know, with, that, with that in mind, then I had to try and figure out, well, how do I explain this in terms of uh, uh, our understanding of gravity? Because it, it showed that our understanding of how planets behave when they become close to one another, they exchange electrical energy, thunderbolts of the gods. And these thunderbolts are nothing like the little sparks we see in the sky today. They had a shape. You've seen Zeus's thunderbolt. It's like a corkscrew-shaped football. He's clenching it in the center. Or the Tibetan dorje, you know, the Tibetan thunderbolt. That's an exact representation of the uh, appearance in the sky. So all of these things means that our history and the history of the Earth and our survival are a story which is completely different. I mean, people read about these things in their creation stories and their religions. They just don't understand what it is they're reading or yeah, looking at. Yeah, I was listening to another interview about, what was it called, Saturn, Saturn Death Cult, something along this line. Are you familiar with this? No, I'm not, but there have been a lot of people who've picked up on this Saturnian story because uh, all of the ancients said that uh, Saturn was our former son. Even the Australian Aborigines have a story of when there were two sons in the sky, a mother son and a lesser son, and one of them gets trapped at the, in the top of a hollow tree, 
Now, this hollow tree is the plasma column that was this, one of these discharge effects. So uh, the tree of life and the world mountain, all of these things, suddenly you, you understand them. And in understanding, you understand all of the stories that we still cling to but don't understand ourselves. And Velikovsky, um, at the, towards the end of his life, wrote a book, Mankind in Amnesia, and he pointed out that unless we can heal ourselves from this post-traumatic stress disorder, we are in danger of destroying ourselves and our environment because we try and, and reenact the destruction of the gods. This is what our crazy warlike behavior is all about mm. because we, it, in the event, it seems that those survivors blamed others for what happened. This is trying to take control back to our level from these uh, totally uncontrollable and destructive gods in the sky. <laughs> so what do we do? We say, well, this wouldn't have happened if those people over there who, who worshipped this other planet hadn't <laughs> hadn't been doing it. You know, we were punished. So we've got to punish them. And so you have them racing off and trying to obliterate each other you begin to get some idea of what it is that bugs us and makes us behave like crazies. The, I think this uh, interviewer was talking about how at this time when Saturn was the the former sun, that the atmosphere mm -hmm. was, then the light was, that the every <coughs> sort of condition was so vastly different than it currently is. Uh, this is yes. part of the reason it's so difficult to kind of understand these old stories because yes. the conditions on Earth were not what they were then. They're, they're, totally, right. they're totally different. Yes. We can tell that the uh, environment was completely different because the dinosaurs, those massive animals, could not exist in present-day gravity. And, of course, this was another clue for me. It meant that the gravity of a planet or a star or any other object in the universe will change depending on the uh, its charge state. In other words, its electrical polarization. This comes down to the fact, as I said earlier, that magnetism and gravity are the effect of polarization of matter by an electric field. And uh, if you change the charge on the Earth, then its gravity changes and its its effective mass changes. And we've actually got evidence for that because when these large uh, solar flares strike the Earth, those solar flares are a massive outpouring of electrical charge. The Earth intercepts some of that, and when it does so, its charge changes. When that happens, the Earth suddenly slows. They call it a glitch. And then it gradually recovers back to its former state. Well, there's no explanation for that. I mean, they talked about the atmosphere being heated, and, <laughs> but that's too slow. It's a sudden change. But the electrical model of gravity uh, explains it simply. And we can also understand then how dinosaurs could exist when the gravity of the Earth was a, a third or less of what it is today. You know, I'm just going to throw this at you, uh, see see what you make of it. But there are some there are some people that uh, talk about how our DNA is going to be changing and has changed as a result of forces such as these. Uh, do you have any any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, the one of the things about this story, of course, is that uh, we were facing destruction. And yet, when we look back in the uh, fossil record, we've had these great dyings, as they call them. But afterwards, there's a whole range of new animals appear. It seems that the feedback mechanism, whatever's required, the epigenetics to change the DNA and its, uh, uh, what do you call it, the way the DNA is read or uh, activated, can change with, you know, almost overnight. In other words, the parents, whatever the parents have suffered, it must be able to modify the, the offspring in such a way as to enhance their chance of survival. Now, I, I, uh, in the electric universe, of course, life is universal. It means that anywhere in the universe that the conditions have arisen where life can exist and has found a way of existing, that information is available if that condition arises somewhere else in the universe. So you get around the problem that Fred Hoyle had with this whole idea of random mutations uh, giving you life forms on Earth. He said the, 
I think that's where he introduced the Google Plex as the chances against <laughs> mm. such a thing ever working. No, it has to be a coherent system and one which doesn't have to reinvent life on every single new planet that's formed in the universe. It doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, <laughs> there are all sorts of other ideas, of course. When I talk about these things, they just pop into my head and I, I am in great danger of diverging from what I was talking about. <laughs> mm. But, um, of course, the uh, stories about the Saturnian environment, we call it the proto-Saturnian because Saturn uh, also changed in this whole process. A star is an electrical phenomenon and uh, a red dwarf, as they're called, which is a misnomer, uh, they, they don't appear as a dwarf at all. We were orbiting inside its um, electrical sheath. It's uh, called an anode glow. And inside that environment is the best place for life to form because if you're inside a, uh, a glowing sphere, the energy you receive on every square inch of your body is the same. It doesn't matter if it's the top of your head, the soles of your feet, or, you know. And for a planet or a satellite orbiting inside a red star, because the red glow is much larger than the actual star itself, um, <clears throat> it's like the um, moons of Jupiter. If the magnetosphere of Jupiter, which is its electrical environment, were to light up, it would look at opposition of the same size as the moon in the sky. You know, huge. All of those satellites would be orbiting inside that red glow. Now, that means that the conditions on Earth were the same from pole to equator. This is why you have uh, huge deposits of coal in the uh, polar regions. And also the evidence of dinosaurs in uh, the Antarctic, for instance, uh, and huge uh, growth of ferns and so on, because we were getting atmosphere from Saturn, and it was a lot of it was in the form of water. That's why its rings are water ice, um, and that misted down. This is the description the ancients had: the light. There was a golden light. The sky was a purplish. It was the um, the golden age, they called it, and everyone after the all of the rearrangement of the solar system yearned for that return to the golden age because it was the ideal place for life. But in some ways, when I think I've thought about it, it, um, it must have been a hell of a shock to be released from that environment because for the first time you would see stars, the twinkling light of other stars and the... Uh, the night sky. There wouldn't have been a night sky until that time. <laughs> not People complain. Uh, not unlike a baby being born. Yes, yes. And I sometimes wonder if it was all deliberate. <laughs> because the very fact that we landed up in the Goldilocks zone, as they called it, around this present star, is something that I have no idea you know, how we managed that. <laughs> uh, this is... Um, this gets down to uh, where does thought play a role? Where does um, uh, having a dream, uh, a wish for something to happen, and how does it manifest? Uh, all of these questions come to mind as a result. But it certainly makes you feel a part of an intelligent universe, the very fact that we're here and doing what we do now. But I... I just, my wish is that the human race can finally heal itself from this post-traumatic stress disorder and become useful citizens of the universe. When, does the, does the basic kind of understanding in quantum physics of the observation of uh, collapsing an electron, this wave collapse, does this jive with electric universe? Is this have a place in this model or um, yes. because you kind of alluded to there being because this whole paradigm is built on some some uh, rocky foundations. It's it's kind of not it's not very harmonious. There's some crossover. There's some synergy. And then there's a lot that there's that is, there's no synergy at all. Yes. Well, as I said, the fundamental problems uh revolve around Einstein's work in particular and Niels Bohr and um, quantum theory. 
because Niels Bohr did away with cause and effect. And this is why you had to have a collapsing wave function, which is a purely mathematical concept and has nothing to do with anything. Um, you know, <laughs> the mathematics is fine, but it doesn't explain anything. And people have to realize that, that science is not about mathematics. Mathematics is useful for science once you have a model which makes sense, physical sense. At present, very little of what is classed as uh, modern physics makes any sense at all. You know, we have particles with no mass. Well, that's nonsense because it can have no energy. Um, the photon is supposed to have no mass. Well, that's that, <laughs> and that is ridiculous. You know, the problem they faced if they're going to have a particle that um, existed uh, traveling at the speed of light, it re would require any particle with any mass to have infinite, require infinite energy to get it to the speed of light, according to Einstein. So they said, oh, well, if we give it zero mass, you multiply zero by infinity, and then you come up with a, a real number. Well, that's rubbish, because infinity is not a number. It's a concept. So the mathematicians fool themselves by in introducing infinity into their mathematics, and it happens all the time. And then they do what they call renormalization, which is a, a swindle, really. They you know, lick their fingers, open the window, and stick it out and say, uh, oh, this is what the temperature is, or <laughs> whatever, they plug it in and keep going as if nothing had happened. But as soon as you have infinity in a mathematical um, proposition, uh, you're no longer talking physics. So um, the electric universe says that light is a combination of two things. One is this instantaneous connection between uh, two particles, two electrons, say, the electron in the atom, which is... Uh, transmitting the signal and the electron in, the in a receiving atom, that establishes coherence. And the electromagnetic wave, which dawdles its way between the transmitter and the receiver, when it gets to an atom which is coherently tangled with the sending atom, says, I'll take that, thanks. And because all particles in the universe are connected instantaneously, everyone else knows the energy is gone, that atom's got it but it appears to the scientists as if a particle has gone from the sending atom to the receiving atom. It's appearances only. It's a combination of two things. You know, having the transmitting atom and the receiving atom perfectly aligned so that when the, the uh, energy arrives in the form of that electromagnetic disturbance, that atom's ready to take it. Now, that means, of course, with this direct connection, that the experimenter in any uh, quantum experiment is part of the experiment. All matter in the universe is connected instantaneously. So all these spooky, spooky things that happen when they do certain things is because they are a part of the experiment, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so even if they think about it, they can change the result. And they've seen that too in generating random numbers. <clears throat> <laughs> I would like to ask you about, and I know you're at least somewhat familiar with his work because he's been at uh, the Thunderbolts, the Electric Universe Conferences, Gerald Pollack. And, um, yes. I, I wonder, is there a relationship between the plasma that is so foundational in the Electric Universe and easy water, this, um, this sort of so-called fourth phase of water? Uh, Gerald Pollack's work is extremely important uh, in terms of understanding biological systems uh, because, as he points out, uh, the water in our bodies, and we're made up you know, mostly of water, is not in the form of uh, liquid water. It's in the form of a gel, and a gel is this easy water, as he calls it. And um, he's found also, and this is extremely important, that water is tuned to receive infrared energy as the means of producing charge separation in in water molecules. And the water molecules don't exist just as H2O. They, they form structures. And it's those structures that create this gel and this easy water. And the separation of charge is like a battery which can drive biological functions. So this is critical to understanding um, biology. But it's not taught anywhere. 
also the an amazing demonstration of the electrical behavior of water is in that uh, that water bridge where you have two beakers of water uh, filled you know to the top and you put say 10,000 volts or something across a bit, uh, with two electrodes one in one beaker and one in the other and the water of course is attracted across between the two beakers and it forms what's called the water bridge and if you look at that water bridge uh, it sits practically horizontal and you can have the water connected like that and you can go away and come back hours later and it's still there and the water levels in the beakers hasn't changed what's happened is the water is moving from one beaker to the other on the outside of the, that tube and the other water from the other beaker is returning on the inside <laughs> to the other beaker. In other, in other words, the water itself is able to structure itself in such a way as to assist things like blood flow. In fact, if it wasn't for that behavior of water, there wouldn't be any blood flow. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, we're in this world where nothing is nothing is the way that we thought it was right I mean, <laughs> that's that's it yeah wow well i would like to uh final finalize this with just you talking about um ways that people can learn more i know you got a bunch of books out you got a, an annual conference uh a couple different websites tell us what those are uh, let the listeners know okay uh, my personal website is holoscience.com, H-O-L-O science.com. It um, hasn't been <laughs> looked after so well in, the, in recent years because I've transferred most of my work to the thunderbolts.info website, which is the major public uh, outlet. And on there you'll find uh, a forum which you can join in on, on your favourite subject, um, and there are YouTube videos uh, regularly, uh, our space news. I do many of those. And uh, we have a picture of the day, which also discusses uh, new results from uh, other experiments, space shots, all sorts of things. Um, and uh, I mean, there's so much there, you could spend months uh, just watching the YouTube videos. At right now, we have our 2016 conference speeches all available on uh, you, on that um, site for free, and the 2017 uh, sessions, which ran over three days, are available for $29. Who's in the uh, lineup next year? Uh, we're still working on that, and uh, it seems that we are going to have, for the first time, a, an electric universe uh, meeting in England mm. and it looks like being in Bath that famous Roman city <laughs> uh, in the past it's, it's been in uh, Phoenix but uh, we are looking at a, a different venue this year but at this stage it hasn't been uh, finalized um, so this may be the it, Bath may be the new home well, no, we, we're happy to do it anywhere. Uh, in fact, if people have the facilities or an organisation that is capable of um, putting on an Electric Universe meeting, we will do everything in our power to, uh, you know, assist that. I should mention the two books too. Uh, David Talbot and I have co-authored two books. The first uh, one was um, uh, to do with the mythological status of of this theory and the other one uh, which uh, I co-authored with him is The Electric Universe which outlines the the kind of rewriting of the astronomy in electrical terms but uh, right now I'm w working on a book which covers all of the sorts of things we've been talking about today. When's that coming out? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> the uh, the pressures on me uh, have grown to the point where I'm going to have to uh, retire to a desert island, I think, to, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> but as soon as possible. Well, good luck with the finishing of that. Thank you, Walt Thornhill, for coming on the program. Th Thanks, Jonathan.